the old Socratic maxim. <laughs> and finally, self-surrender. Self-surrender is, again, an extension of what I said earlier. One of the five obstacles is e egoity. Well, self-surrender is minimizing more and more whether it's a surrender to a specific uh, divine image that I have in mind, Ishvara in Patanjali is the name of such a uh, kind of divinity, or whether it's simply self-surrender uh, of the ego to the higher notion of spirit. But the notion of not interposing myself as an ego, uh, with a small e, all the time between myself and experience is, I think, what is meant by self-surrender. This openness to the universe, which is, after all, what I'm trying here to form a union with. So yama and niyama, the two ethical, uh, first two prepar preparatory steps to yoga. Um, the th third, fourth, and fifth you might consider as belonging to the realm somehow of physiology. Because the third is postures, asanas, and in the West we would think of these as hatha yoga, certain postures that are geared to, max, to maximize, to make most fit the vehicle, the instrument, the body through which the yogin expresses himself in his life. Um, fourth, regulation of breath, pranayama, prana you've all heard of, the, the economy of um, using prana in such a way that the energy which I need for higher states of consciousness circulates through me with the least obstruction possible. So the efficient, let's say, and intelligent utilization of, draw, of prana. Uh, fifth, now we're already moving into what we think of as meditation proper. We're in the antechamber of meditation. And that is pratyahara, the withdrawal of the senses from their objects. Yoga is, it's been said, centripetal. If you think of forces in nature, a car, going around a curve or whatever, it's the law of physics, centrifugal force takes me from the center outward. The projectile goes that way. <laughs> and in our daily contact with things, with people, that is the force uh, which most of us utilize centrifugally from in to out. But yoga is exactly the opposite. It wants to go centripetally, back from the outside to within, till it can go no further. And so, withdrawal of the senses from their objects, a way in which I might put this is, if you're going to meditate and find that inner stillness and ultimate wholeness of self, you would not do it very easily if you sat down in the, in the middle of Times Square during New Year's Eve, would you? So, if you take that as the one extreme of it, clearly, unless the mind is no longer bombarded, or even the sense, sensory apparatus, the eyes and the ears and whatever, sense of touch, by this dizzying profusion of stimuli, of, of sense, sensory input that we all have coming to us all the time, uh, this union, this withdrawal into the inner recesses of what, well, we'll get to that, becomes virtually impossible, until at least you've mastered it. After you've mastered it, and are an adept, uh, perfect yogin, then I suppose it's possible to do it even in the middle of Times Square. But at least this is not how one learns to do it. So pratyahara, the withdrawal of the senses from their object, and that completes the five lower limbs of yoga. And now one is ready for, I think, the most intriguing, most mysterious aspects of yoga. And those are the higher limbs, as Patanjali said. These are quite different. Now the organism has, by intent, by effort in his daily life, ordered his life, regulated it in a certain way, prepared his body through the asanas and his energies through um, the pranayama, through the regulation of this prana, and has minimized, insofar as is possible, the input, the sensory input, which he calls withdrawal of the senses from their objects, by retiring to a quiet place and all that. And now he's ready for what one might call the higher states of consciousness. The first two are ethics, the se second three 
are physiology and the, high, the last three one might call higher states of consciousness. <laughs>